on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, I welcome you back to this session of JLF's Brave New World Season Two. Magazine partner for this series is the Week Journalism with a Human Touch. Those of you who missed our earlier episode, which was fabulous, open the story of human progress. Johan Norberg in conversation with Shruti Rajagopalan. Please catch it on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF, or on our Facebook page. JLF Lit Fest. Our next session of the day is Love Without a Story. Arundhati Subramaniam in conversation with Rahul Pandita. Poet and writer Arundhati Subramaniam conjures the essence of the spiritual and the sublime through her writing practice. Subramaniam's latest book of poems, Love Without a Story, circles the ideas of time, intimacy, and the urgency of conversations. And in conversation with author and journalist Rahul Pandita, she takes us on a journey through her words, inspirations, and faith. And she's also written a poem on Zoom. Arundhati Subramanian is an award-winning award Her recent book, Love Without a Story, is forthcoming internationally from a Blood Axe Books in November 2020. Widely translated and anthologized, her previous volume, when God is a Traveller was the season's choice of the Poetry Book Society, shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. Her prose work includes the Book of Buddha, the best-selling biography of a contemporary mystic, Sadhguru, More Than a Life, and as editor, the Penguin Anthology of Bhakti Poetry, Eating God. Rahul Pandita is a journalist and an author based in Delhi. He's a Yale World Fellow of 2015, He's also the writer of the Hindi film Shikara, directed by Vidhu Vinod Chopra, and his books include Hello Buster and Our Moon Has Blood Clots. So you all know all our sessions are available on Facebook page JLF LitFest and on our YouTube channel Jaipur LitFest JLF. Please do remember to ask questions and comment by typing it into the comment section. And Rahul Pandita will ask these questions of Arundhati at the end of the session. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you know where to find us on Facebook and YouTube. And in case we freeze or drop off, just hang in there and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, love without a story. Arundhati Subramaniam in conversation with Rahul Pandita. Arundhati, Rahul, over to you. Thank you, Sanjoy. Uh, welcome, Arundhati. Uh, it's you. been more. It's been more than a year. I was thinking uh, that we met during the release of your book, uh, not very far from where I uh, sit now, talking to you. And, uh, it almost strikes me that it's been almost a decade since we first met, Rahul. I met you at the Hay Festival, organized by the very same team in uh, Tiruvannantapuram. Yeah, I was also, reminded of it when I when I took out your. Uh, uh, books, um, uh, you know, and um, you were kind enough to sign a couple of them for me. Uh, one the first time when we met at here, as you mentioned, um, and one last year when we uh, met during our uh, conversation here when your book was released. Yes. Um, so I'll begin with uh, the the uh, pandemic. You know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, how this pandemic has changed things around us. And at a personal level, my perception of so many things has uh, changed. I always thought that I could not live without certain things in life. For example, a conversation with a dear friend or a visit to a favorite cafe or a visit to a bookstore. And here we are seven months uh, from the onset of pandemic uh, without these things and we are very much alive. And on the flip side, there are so many things which you took for granted. Uh, and then you realize that those things are so vital to you. So I wanted to begin by asking you, how has been your experience of the pandemic so far? I think uh, the initial months, Rahul, were very difficult because although in many ways, I'm, I've always believed I'm reasonably accustomed to the hermit's life. I go through spells of great travel and I also go through spells of retreat. Despite that, I found myself very uncomfortable. Uh, there was a great sense of disquiet. I think some of which one was picking up atmospherically. 
And it took me time to settle in and to just decide that my way of navigating this time was going to be by simplifying things. I mean, we were being forced to simplify them. Right. But I decided, for instance, not to force myself to write, which was um, an important personal decision, and to actually trust simpler rhythms, you know, just eating and sleeping and reading and exercising and not doing very much. Yes. I think after that, some of the panic began to subside. But it has been really a time like none other. And I feel that the shift is on many levels, Rahul. I mean, not just what we are seeing around us, you know, environmentally, politically, but certainly internally, almost on some kind of cellular level. There seems to be all kinds of uh, shifts. And I think the challenge of this time has really been to, um, to attend to that, not to be in a hurry to turn the page because we cannot turn this page, right. but to attend to it. I think uh, that's a that's a valid argument because when the pandemic started, uh, some of us got into this uh, panic mode of sorts that we should utilize this time into doing something so-called meaningful, uh, which for writers means that you know you have to put in a certain number of hours uh, to write. Uh, but towards the end of few weeks, uh, you know, later I realized that the best thing right now is to just stay alive. <laughs> And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, just read, sleep, take care of your mental health, etc. cetera. Um, so those things are um, uh, more important. And as the pandemic rolls on, we should be able to do it more and more. Mm -hmm. I, I now uh, want to uh, start with uh, your book. This is uh, Arundhati's uh, most recent book, uh, Love Without a Story, which came out in 2019. Um, and... Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the title of the book, um, Love Without a Story. I always thought in my head that love and storytelling is something uh, which go together, you know, they are like companions. And here you are, uh, <laughs> you know, titling your uh, a recent book, Love Without a Story. So what was the I idea behind this I title? Thought so <laughs> I thought so too. I think most of my life I believe love stories, you know, love and story just go together, don't they? Um. Actually, you know, I was reading someone's blog and she happened to mention this book and she says, you know, if you look through this book, you won't find the title poem because there is no title poem. And that's true. There's no poem with this title, but the line actually features in one of the poems. Right. And I think that line perhaps sums up why this, uh, why this title happened. I'm going to read those four lines to you. Yes. But before that, I just want to say that I think very you know, to respond to this very briefly, I think there comes a time when some stories, at least not all at the same time, hopefully maybe that happens at the end of one's life, but there are times when some stories collapse or they subside or some of the drama around them melts away. This could be in, you know, in terms of any relationship that one has had, whether it's romantic or familial or with friends or with a planet or with a plant or with an animal, yes. you know, any of it. When that drama, when the narrative subsides, there's a pause and there's you. And if you're not in a hurry to fill in that pause with yet another story, I think what remains is a certain gaze a gaze that is without neediness, without recrimination, without bitterness, without rancor. If you're able to sustain that gaze for a little while, right. it's a state akin to something that could be called love. You know, it's a kind of affectionate, somewhat humorous glance at the world a reasonably inclusive glance that um, includes more than it leaves out, you know? And I think that's the kind of gaze that was, I was interested in, in this book. So there is a central woman character in, the, in a cycle of poems in this book, and she's Abayar, who's an oh, ancient yeah. Tamil woman poet and wanderer and uh, an old woman, a wise old woman. And I use her voice through several poems in this book. And in one of the poems she says, and that should answer the question perhaps more succinctly than I am right now. 
She says, for lovers flatten into photographs, photographs into reminiscence, reminiscence into quiet. And then what's left? Perhaps just the oldest thing in the world, love without a story. <laughs> yeah, that quite uh, sums it up all. Mm -hmm. I I want to talk to you about now um, a little bit about the process of writing. When I, you know, when I uh, put information about this session uh, earlier today on 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 some social media handles, there are some young readers who are, re you know, who have read your work and are very keen to understand um, your process of writing. So I'm going to divide that question into two parts. One is, of course, the the pattern of writing. What works for you? Do you write daily, like Rembrandt used to say, not a single day without a line? Uh, or do you wait for a spark or an inspiration? How does it work for you? Well, because I have twitchy fingers, I'm at a laptop almost daily. And I write daily, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm writing a poem. I'm mm -hmm. often tinkering with old poems, or I'm responding to someone's manuscript of poetry, or... Um, I'm reading poems or writing a review, I'm writing prose. So in some way, the writing continues, it happens daily. And I'm breathing in poetry, inhaling it fairly regularly. But I'm not writing a poem daily, certainly. What I do, Rahul, is to perhaps, do I wait for a poem? I'd say yes and no. There are times when one gets anxious because one isn't writing poetry. And so then you start, you know, uh, scratching pen on paper or, you know, getting on with it. But I'm not sure it always works with that much manual labor. You need a mix of manual labor and magic. And <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can't do without, uh, you need both, mm -hmm. really, in equal measure. You know, I wouldn't uh, prioritize one over the other. And the second part of the question is, you know, how, do, how does a poem take shape? Um, how do you choose the theme? Uh, do you think of, do you think in terms of a visual? Um, is there a flash of memory? Is there a line or a word you read which triggers of a poem? Or is it a mix of everything? Really? I suppose the answer is a mix. I'd say sometimes it's a line, you know, it's a line that is a phrase that draws you. And it seems to sort of summon you in some peremptory way and you feel you've got to follow it and see where it leads you. And often that line is an image. And I found that... Um, I often say this at poetry workshops, that when that image happens, and it could be a visual image, as you say, it could also be an olfactory image, you know, the smell of something. Right. Uh, when that image happens, it could be any kind of image, the touch, the you know, smell, taste, sound, anything. But when that image starts formulating itself in words, there is a hunch that you have that you've got to follow it. You know, this deserves to be followed. And I always say at workshops, make sure you follow it because an image is always wiser than you are. You know, uh, it always leads you to places, perhaps within yourself, but places that you didn't quite know existed. So follow the image, it's usually worth it. It's always more intelligent, you know, than any agenda that you have at the start of the poem. So do I work with an agenda? Sometimes, but I'm very, very accustomed to having that agenda subverted in some way in the course of writing. Uh, this uh, image reminds me of something, you know, there's a uh, poem called Goddess in your recent anthology. And you yes. quote a couple of lines from uh, Abhirami Bhattar, uh, translated from Tamil. And it says, it's enough to sit alone and gaze at you, three-eyed goddess who needs to go meditate. I'm reminded of this, uh, that uh, picture I sent you long ago from Elai Nataraja Temple in Chidambaram, taken by this uh, great photographer, Santu Brahma, uh, which triggered of something inside me and I went on that uh, pilgrimage in the October of 2017. Now that yes. we remember it, it's been three years since that journey, which ended up in Chennai and, you know, uh, the two of us meeting. But I also know, Rahul, that you have an even longer journey with, uh, in terms of the fascination with the goddess, don't you? Oh, because yes. I remember you also told me about the Kshir Bhavani temple right. in, uh, in Srinagar. Yes. So was it a family connection with that temple? There was more than that. It was a very personal connection, wasn't it? I, I don't know. I mean, it was a personal connection. It, is, it was just, 
I felt that the goddess was speaking to me and you know it was a great picture where uh, this peasant woman is uh, standing in front of the goddess with her back towards me um mm. and when I saw that picture it felt as if the goddess was speaking to uh, her and through her me and you know it was just irresistible um and I thought to myself that I have to go and see the temple and and that is what led to that um, um pilgrimage in, in, in 2017, uh, which reminds me that, um, you know, you spoke about the, the poet uh, Awayar. And um, in, in this anthology, I have a favorite uh, poem, um, number five in the fine art of aging. Um, uh, it would be wonderful if you could uh, recite that poem. It's, uh, it's on five? page 41. Okay. Oh, I see. That one. I like the way it ends. <laughs> yes. And well, we'll I mean, endings. Yes. We'll talk about that. I just want to say before I read it for those who um, you don't need to know the details of the Abaya story really to understand this. But I just want to give you a word of background. Yes. This is a moment when Abaya, this wise old woman poet, is seated under a tree, and a little boy on the tree asks her, uh, "Granny, which?" which fruit do you want? The hot fruit or the lukewarm fruit? And this just seems like a silly game to this old woman. And she's seen through many games. It turns out in the traditional, in the legend, this little boy turns out to be a god himself. This is Muruga. But it's not necessary to know that for, the, for this uh, particular reading. All I want to share with you is this old woman who doesn't in this retelling of the story, doesn't receive her kamapuns from this god. She's kind of almost as wise as he is. <laughs> so that's the, that's the poem. So what's it going to be, Gran? Asks the little boy on the tree. A hot fruit or a lukewarm one? Says the little boy on the tree, his left cheek bulging with jamun and laughter. Pure cheek, really. Abayar sighs. She knows the tiresome games of the young, trick questions, riddles, puns, crosswords, wisecracks, bon mots, limericks, anagrams. She knows little boys grow into men that scintillate, men that pontificate, men that dribble curses, men that cannot apologize gray-faced men, men that turn love to ash, men with shiny weapons and kettle drum agitations, men with epic stories, epic vanities, epic bibliographies, epic, epic, men that make young girls giggle and <laughs> silently plot vengeance, Vedantin men, men with restless gazes, men that sip white wine and drip Malarme, Abayar sighs. The thing about age is seeing through the game, but being able to smile at those who play it. All right, she says. All right, boy. Make it lukewarm. <laughs> Beautiful, Arundhati. You know, I've... Uh often noticed and um, I was reading some of your previous interviews and uh, there's at least one more person who has noticed this. Um, I guess in this case, um, what we have felt is that, you know, there are at least some poems where you, uh, you know, which follow a certain structure and mm -hmm. suddenly towards the end, you know, there's a, there's a line that, that kind of stands alone, uh, mm -hmm. which can be seen in a completely different light, you know, in a standalone light from the rest of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, in this uh, anthology, for example, the first poem, the last line is still best to meet in person. Mm. Um, um, in this anthology, for example, there's this um, poem called Learning to Say Yes, and uh, there are three lines towards the end of it. Um, fill out the form, uh, do it in bloody triplicate, enroll. So I was wondering whether it's a matter of style or do some poems ask for an ending like this? It's a good question. I think Rahul, first I'll say that 
you know, the beginning of a poem is always hugely important to me. And this is something I was aware of as a student, you know, when just growing up reading poetry and later as a student of literature, I always found myself very drawn to the poetry of John Donne, the 17th century um, English metaphysical poet. And I was drawn to him because of the very arresting opening lines of his poetry. You know, there's one love poem where he says, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. You know, it's that kind of line which I haven't forgotten. I've forgotten the rest of the poem, but that first line I haven't forgotten. So the first line always becomes important for me, but equally the last line, as you point out, I'd say that much of it is really about in the draft stage, one is often spreading oneself on the page. You might write three pages of what you think is a poem. Mm -hmm. But when you put it away, when I put it away and return to it, what I look for is a certain oscillation, which I like, between image and statement. So there has to be image leading up to statement. I cannot have just statement after statement because then it doesn't make sense to me. But when a statement emerges from an image, I trust it. So there has to be image and statement. And I also like the oscillation between expansion and contraction. So I allow a poem to expand, but up to a point. And frequently, it's about knowing when to shut up, you know, and I think a lot of this, my sadhana, as far as poetry is concerned, has just been about learning when to shut up, which is to cut the flab ruthlessly at the point when you know when to say more would be counterproductive. It would just ruin the poem entirely. So when you arrive at that line, much of it, much of your sadhana is about learning to recognize that line and then to, to back off. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I, I, um, I particularly like this, uh, you know, image followed by a statement without which it doesn't make sense. Um, mm -hmm. I hope uh, the young readers who have sent me questions are watching this uh, because they have a lot to learn. To they have a lot to learn from uh, this conversation. Um, you know, from from some of your uh, previous books, I, I I get this impression that. Um, some of the overarching themes of uh, your poetry remain, uh, you know, love, uh, loss, um, uh, the idea of home. I also felt that um, some of your poems come from a deep voice through which you address the idea of God. Um, would you like to talk about, uh, about it a bit? About God? Yes. Or about the other themes, if you like, the idea of home, for example. Actually, looking back, my first book happened in 2001, and most of those poems were written in the 90s. And when, when I look at the first book, and I look at the most recent, I agree, these are pretty much the recurrent themes, you know, love, loss, place, you know, situation is important, so city often. Yes. Uh, and home, or the absence of home. Journeys, you know, often the quest is very important. And uh, sometimes geographical real journeys and sometimes mythic journeys. And God. God, yes. But, you know, and the goddess, of course, as you point out as well in this book, she's there. You know, her presence is very much there. I think I've been fascinated by um, a certain time. I think so. Let me put it this way. I think the existential journey in some way has always been there from the very beginning when I look back on the first book. But the textures have definitely changed. And what interests me, I think third book onwards, has been the places where the sensual and the sacred come together. Sometimes they collide, sometimes they meet seamlessly. But I'm interested in those places where the sublime gets crunchy you know, where things get, uh, where they are tactile and smoky at the same time. You know, so I'm interested in that, that space, which is the space that reminds us, I think, that we are both matter and spirit. We are not just one or the other, we are both. And uh, 
I'm drawn to the Bhakti poets, the Sufi poets, you know, the mystic poets generally for reminding us of this in their own very uh, diverse and singular ways. But I suspect that that's been my own personal journey, Rahul, which has also intensified, you know, which many people say oh, turning spiritual seems to mean in their minds um, some kind of vanilla approach to, to life, you know, a kind of aseptic, antiseptic, um, tepid approach to things. When in fact, my own journey personally, as well as uh, the kind of poetry that I'm interested in, has been about quite the reverse. That, you know, the spiritual journey or the intensifying spiritual journey has not been about turning into some kind of cabbage. You know, cabbagehood has not been either the aspiration or the experience. It has in fact been about turning more alive, about participating much more in one's own life than ever before. So I think these facile kind of binaries that the world often presents us with uh, are precisely what the poems themselves attempt to challenge. This binary between this world and the other. That's one of the particular binaries that I enjoy challenging. In fact, in, you'll find gods are, you know, my poems are interested in the places where gods meet humans. They frequently have conversations. Those are the sorts of spaces that interest me. You also spend, a, a, you know, spend your time between Chennai and Coimbatore. You've written a biography of um, uh, Sadhguru. Tell us a little bit about your time at the Isha Ashram and how it has influenced your journey, especially your spiritual journey. Perhaps in too many ways to mention, but I'd say... You know, in many ways, my journey as a poet hasn't been so separate from my journey as a seeker. The two have gone together. Uh, there was a point in my life when I felt very abandoned by language. And at that point, poetry abandoned me entirely. But when it started coming back, I think I realized that um, both my spiritual journey and my journey through poetry were about coming to terms in some way with uncertainty, you know, not looking for conclusions, not looking for security, but looking for ways to be comfortable with commas, with question marks, with uh, colons and semicolons, not reaching for what can be very beguiling, which is the full stop, but learning, in fact, to live with a greater sense of wonder rather than a sense of um, dogmatism. You know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable around dogmatism of any kind, whether it's sacred or secular or religious or political. I'm just uncomfortable with too many full stops. So I think this allowed me to, the, the spiritual journey, and certainly being in the ashram, which is this wonderfully energized space, and certainly the, um, the guidance, the spiritual guidance of Sadhguru, which is not about a verbal guidance necessarily, it's been much more about opening up an inner journey. I think that journey has really been about deepening my understanding of commas, understanding myself more as a bridge between uh, matter and spirit, realizing I don't have to choose one or the other simply because we are not one or the other. We are both. That's a short That's answer to a question that I could have it's, uh, uh, it's wonderful. Um, at this moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, read a, a poem from uh, this anthology. It's about, uh, uh, no, from the other, if you remember. Um, it's called My Friends. Oh, it's from the earlier book? Yes. I might have to pull it out because I don't know if I have it. Let me see if I can pull it out here. Yes, Rahul, it's here. Oh, okay. okay. <coughs> you mean the one from uh, When God is a Traveller? Yes. Okay. So it's one of my that? favorite poems from this, I um, mean, yours. Okay. I haven't read this it in a very two favorite poems of mine. One, this, and uh, the other is I speak for those with orange lunchboxes. I remember you writing to me after that, after I first read that poem. Okay, my friends. 
I must say, Rahul, before I read this, this is intended to be a very affectionate poem to friends. It may not sound that way, but it is an affectionate poem. <laughs> My friends, they're sodden, the lot of them, leafy with more than a whiff of damage, mottled with history, dark with grime. God knows I've wanted them different, less preoccupied, more jaunty, less handled with care, more airbrushed, less prone to impossible dreams, less perishable, a little more willing to soak in the sun. They don't measure up, they're unpunctual, they turn suddenly tuberous, but they matter for their crooked smiles, their endless distractions, their sudden pauses, signs that they know how green stems twist and thicken as they vanish into the dark, making their way through their own sticky vernacular tissues of mud, improvising, blundering, improvising. Wonderful. I think uh, we have time for uh, one more question and then we'll take up audience questions. Uh, what happens between poetry? Um, I believe you were reading Simone Weil um, early this year and I was just reminded of um, a situation in her life and she goes to a farm owned by a family friend where um, she begs that she be allowed to labor and uh, after a tired day, um, she lies on the haystack and reads one of her favorite poems uh, by George Herbert Love, um, mm. which shaped her life in, um, in many ways. Um, I was just reminded of that um, uh, moment in her life. So what happens between poetry, Harundati? It's a very good question, Rahul. And since it's our last question, I know we don't have much time to spend on it, but I'll say what happens is um, a quest. There's a quest underway and sometimes that quest can only be handled by doing the very simplest things, whether it's answering an email, whether it's uh, allowing yourself time to daydream, whether it's um, turning to your, whoever your Ishtadevta is, your goddess and saying, fill my heart with, with, with love, with more love and more understanding and more uh, joy. There are just so many ways uh, in which one tries to spend those, uh, you know, fills in those gaps. And then there are conversations with friends and there are books and there's um, more poetry, all the poetry that one hasn't read or the poems that one wants to revisit. There's so much of that. And um, there's also the need to sharpen, which I think this is perhaps the most important thing for any poet, and perhaps for anyone on a spiritual journey as well, which is to sharpen the faculty of listening. You know, that is the most uh, endangered art of our times, isn't it? I really do believe that. And um, to hone that capacity in some way, which in fact brings me to the poem, uh, my goddess poem, which I'd, which I'd like to share with you because you actually brought up goddesses at the very start of this conversation. It's a two line poem and it's addressed to the goddess Linga Bhairavi, but it could be any goddess of your choice or any way in which you choose to visualize the divine feminine. So the poem goes, in her burning rainforest, Silence is so alive, you can hear. Listen. Beautiful, Arundhati. I think I'm just going to take a few questions that have come. And uh, I think Abhay has, uh, Srishti has asked, uh, or Abhay has asked, sorry. Um, one of my favorite poems of yours is Mitti, where you sort of reveal the hidden relationship between human beings and the celestial body. How did you come up with the poem and what was the inspiration? That's a good question. You know, I've always seen myself as a city poet. 
-hmm. So there have been trees and, um, you know, little patches of ocean in my poetry. But um, it's always been the city landscape, you know, uh, punctuating it. But this time, one of the things that's been noticed in this book is precisely the fact that there's a lot of natural uh, imagery in it. And this particular poem happened because a newspaper, and I think this was the DNA, uh, got in touch with me and asked me if I would write a poem. I think they asked more than one poet to do this. They wanted, they said, we'll give you a word, a word suggested by a reader. And it will be a word in an Indian language other than English. And can you find a way to incorporate that into a poem? So it seemed like a fun exercise and I agreed. And then the word that I was given by this reader, whom I'm yet to meet, I hope she or he will show up at some point. Uh, the word that I was assigned was mitti. And I must say my first response was actually disappointment because I thought, oh God, am I being asked to write a poem that suggests uh, that the mitti on which I stand is unlike the, the mitti on which you stand and some kind of... Uh, you know, chest thumping uh, patriotic poem, which I didn't want to do because it would have just been far too predictable. At the same time, I wanted to acknowledge the singularity of the Mitti that I know, which is mm. for me the smell of um, the monsoons in Bombay, just, you know, the advent of that and the smell of the earth. So I wanted to acknowledge the uniqueness of that, but I also wanted to acknowledge that everyone has their own unique Mitti. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to go about it. Until I started, I just stayed with the word, Mitti, and allowed it to lead me. And it led me to my childhood and the fact that I actually ate mud as a child. And it led me to uh, the way in which I actually look at the role of poets. As I say in the poem, the role of the poet is really to be messenger between moon and mud. You know, that's the kind of bridge you're trying to be. So it led me to that. And then it led me to language, you know. Uh, all sorts of words for mud in various languages. I just felt the need to bring all of that in so that it became a bit of a festival of mud mm -hmm. in, uh, in many ways. And uh, yes, that's how the poem happened. Thank you for the question. Is that Srishti who asked it? Thank you, Srishti. Abhay, Abhay. Um, and Rachel asks, uh, does any phase of your life reflect in any of the, these poems of the book? Well, these poems in this book were written over the past five years. So in some way or the other, they reflect the past five years of my life, certainly. I mean, that doesn't mean it's, you know, a one-on-one -on -one biographical correspondence, but definitely the flavor, the, the feel of these poems is the past five years. Vidya uh, Sharma asks, uh, poetry as a form holds the power of healing the heart far better than any other form. What is it about the form that called out to you at the beginning of your career? Mm, that's a lovely question. I think it's distillation, you know? It is such a distilled art. And I think that's part of the reason it is the medicine that she describes, you know, the kind of, th that's the reason it has therapeutic value because it is language that is birthed under conditions of such heat and pressure that only the absolutely essential remains, which doesn't mean you have to write, uh, you know, a haiku to be a poet. It just means that this is language pared down to its most beautiful and to its most essential and to its truest, you know. So I think that's what makes it this um, dark art. You know, it is a form of enchantment. That's the reason we turn to the mantra. It's the reason why we turn to poetry. Netul asks, uh, uh, I guess it's uh, similar to what I asked you. Many of your poems have line breaks and indents at surprising points. Form-wise, what determines this space you deliberately leave on page? That's a very good question too. I think I've always used free verse largely, but it's, in the past um, 10 years, I'd say that I've gone, I've become much more aware of um, the freedom of free verse. You know, I think my verse is freer now than it ever was, uh, by which I mean that I think I'm much more conscious uh, of why lines end where they end and 
that could be for different reasons. Sometimes it's simply following the diktats of breath. And I'm more aware of my breath now than I was earlier and breathing differently. That's surely reflected in the poetry. And at times it reflects a shift in tone. Whereas earlier, I think I largely worked according to thought units. And that's what divided the poems. Whereas now I think it's more inflected than that. And uh, at least that's the sense that I get that my poems breathe differently. And so those white spaces on a page of poetry mean something, or I'm more conscious of what they mean than I ever was before. Your next question is from Tapeshwar Prasad and it relates to the art of breathing. He says, uh, he asks rather, is poetry the breath of breathless? That's a, that's a nice, uh, that has a wonderful epic, epigrammatic air. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, rather than simply answer that with another aphorism, I would say that essentially poetry is about discovering the timber of your voice. And everyone has a very unique timber. And you spent a lot of your time, or at least I did, in periods of unconscious apprenticeship, when you try to sound like others unconsciously, and uh, often end up mimicking poets you dislike, because you don't intend to, but you end up doing all of that. All that is part of a process of apprenticeship. Yes. And gradually, I think you discover a timber that feels like you. And how do you know that that timber is yours? I think you know that it's yours when you realize that artistry and authenticity are beginning to converge. They are not on parallel tracks all the time. I think we're going to take a last question and it's by uh, Harmeet. And he uh, says, you're a fabulous performance poet, Arundhati. What according to you is the relationship between your speaking voice and writing? It's, uh, there is definitely a connection. And I'd say that I don't really trust a poem even on the page, although I do work on the page. I don't trust it entirely until I have also tasted it on my tongue. So I need to actually be able to taste it on my tongue to completely stand by the poem. So for me, the page is important, but so also the, the living spoken experience of a poem, you know, that is uh, part of its aliveness. A poem should be aching to be released to the human voice. For me, that's the magic of it. I think we can take one more and I don't know whether you can do this or not. Um, but Sandeep Singh says, a poem of yours has etched in my memory. The poem defined my city in a very different way. It changed my idea of Mumbai. Could you please read a few lines of Bombay to us? I'm sure you remember it. The poem? Is that yeah. his, what he, what yes. is he, does he say where I live? Because there are other Mumbai poems too. I would think Maybe. so, yeah. I'll just read the first few lines because I know we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a poem called Where I Live. I live on a wedge of land reclaimed from a tired ocean, somewhere at the edge of the universe. Greetings from the city of L'Oreal sunsets and diesel afternoons, deciduous with concrete, Botox with vanity, City of septic magenta hair clips, garrulous sewers, and tight lipped taps. Welcome to Bombay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arundhati. It was a wonderful having this conversation with you. I know. I just want to say, Rahul, that I think we started a conversation almost a decade ago when we first <laughs> yes. met. I'm glad for the realness of that conversation. Um, I'm always struck by that. We don't meet very often, but when we do, it always feels like we can pick up the threads where we left. Thank you. Same here, Arundhati. Um, over to you, Sanjay. Thanks so much, Rahul. And thanks so much, Arundhati. That was absolutely fabulous to be able to taste the poetry on your tongue and breath or breathless. And for those of you who are listening in, we watched or heard breathlessly as Arundhati read her poetry almost a year ago in Mandra, which is the sort of Venice of uh, Western Australia, in this beautiful, enchanting uh, uh, setting. And uh, while we held our breath, uh, every time she read uh, a poem, 
it was really like um, you know the oxygen uh, and that place is like really fresh air as fresh as you can get with dolphins leaping about uh, a completely different world uh, from where we were so it was quite extraordinary thank you both for this absolutely beautiful beautiful session rahul for moderating it for those of you who have enjoyed this session remember you can log on to jlf uh, lit fest on facebook or uh, jlf lit fest uh, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF on YouTube to catch all our previous session. Please do remember to log back on on Friday, the twenty third of October, to watch another set of great sessions. We've got two menus: poetry and fiction. Rachel Dewaskin in conversation with Ranjit Haskote. Author Rachel Dewaskin's work draws heavily from the ideas of identity, culture, and the self. And in conversation with poet Ranjit Haskote, she discusses her writing journey, exploring the landscapes of poetics. and essence of narratives this is at 7 pm indian standard time 2:30 pm british standard time and 9:30 am eastern daylight time and the second session of the day will be muscular india masculinity mobility and the new middle class the brand new book by michel bass in conversation with vivek atejuja unraveling a world hidden in plain sight michel bass's masculine india muscular india Masculinity, mobility, and the new middle class introduces us to the inner workings of the powerhouse gyms of a new India. And this is at 8:30 p.m. IST, 4 p.m. British Standard Time, and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. For those of you who are spiritual, remember today is Bodhon, the first day of uh, Devi Puja. And Arundhati, thank you even more for the poetry that you shared. um uh, on that occasion the aarti is just finished and the prayers have just finished stay safe stay masked and have a lovely rest of the week uh, catch you on friday same time